Today we'll discuss advanced string algorithms. Strings are some of the most basic data structures that, are, uh, that we learn early in our uh, computer science education. Many programming contests uh, have problems that involve strings. Many of these problems uh, are basic string manipulation problems. Today we'll go further than that. Today we'll explore some algorithms, uh, we'll explore some advanced string algorithms that allow us to efficiently, uh, e efficiently perform tasks on strings using either advanced data structures or clever algorithms. The first dynamic programming problem that we will look at is the longest common subsequence. The longest common subsequence is a problem that asks for the length of the longest subsequence that appears in both of two strings. The difference between a substring and a subsequence is that substrings have to be a consecutive set of characters in a string, whereas subsequences uh, are not necessarily consecutive. So the naive solution to this problem would be to generate all the subsequences of one string and then compare uh, and then check with the other string to see if there are also subsequences of the other string. However, since there are two to the power n, where n is the length of the string, uh, there are two to the power n subsequences in a string because you can either include or not include every single character. The, the runtime for this is O of uh, m times two to the n, where m is the length of one string and n is the length of the other. However, we notice that there is a lot of overlap in subproblems, and we can apply dynamic programming. So there are two cases uh, that we have to consider. When we have, uh, when we have two given strings, um, either the last two characters of the two strings are the same or they are different. If the characters are the same, then the length of the longest common subsequence is simply the length of the longest common subsequence without those without the common last letter plus one. And if they're different, then the the result is simply the maximum of either the first string with the last character removed and the second string, or the second string with the last character removed and the first string. This is our dynamic programming. Um, our base cases are relatively simple. We just we simply set when the index is zero, we set it we set the value in our DP table equal to zero. And after that, we simply applied the the previously mentioned dynamic programming formula. So let's quickly run through and fill fill in this table. So we see that a and a are the same. So that is a one, since there uh, this uh, zero plus a one is a one. And then we can fill out the rest of the, uh, the rest of this row. All of them are going to be one, since none of them are also equal to a. Next, when we look at the next row, we see that a and p and a are not equal, so we take the maximum of either 1 or 0, which comes to be 1. Then, when we look at p and p, p and p are equal. So now we take this value and add 1 to it. And, sim uh, and similarly, we can just fill out the rest of the table. The time complexity of this problem is O of m times n using dynamic programming, because uh, where m and n are the lengths of the two strings, since uh, we have to fill in a, an m by n matrix and we only visit each cell once. Now, we'll briefly look at another dynamic programming problem on strings. Previously, we discussed the length of the longest common subsequence using dynamic programming. Now, we'll use dp to solve a very related problem, the longest common substring problem. Just like the last problem, our dp is performed by doing casework on the last character present in both strings. If the last character is the same in both strings, then the value we store in our dp table is simply 1 plus the value that is already present in the dp table for the strings without the last character. So in this case, for HAP and APP, 3, 3, the value we insert is 1 plus the value at 2, 2. So in this case, 1. However, when the two strings are different, we simply store a zero. We do not have to uh, look back at any other values in our DP table. The, at the end of this process, what we have to do to find the answer is traverse through the entire table and find the maximum value. Because of this operation, our overall time complexity is O of m times n. Later in the lecture, we'll, we will revisit this problem and we'll find a solution that is O of m plus n, using some of the more advanced data structures for strings.
The last dynamic programming problem that we will consider is that of the longest palindromic subsequence, or subsequences, also known as LPS. Palindromes are symmetric in nature, so when coming up with a DP solution to this, we might think about uh, using two different pointers, one on the left side and one on the right side of the string, in order to determine whether or how many characters will remain after some have been deleted in order to make this a palindrome. We perform casework on whether the left pointer is equal to the right pointer. If the, if the two are the same, then our answer is simply the LPS of the inside characters plus two, one for the left pointer, one for the right pointer, after adding them back on. However, if the string has different left and right pointers, then our LPS is equivalent to the maximum of the LPS of the string without the first character or without the last character. For example, in this string, the longest common, uh, the longest palindromic subsequences that are produced are a b c b a, a b d b a, and a b e b a, all of which have length five. The overall time complexity for this task is O of n squared, where n is the length of the string. The next variety of algorithms that we're going to talk about are string matching problems. String matching problems are defined uh, as problems where you're given a text and a pattern and your goal is to identify where in the text the pattern occurs. The naive solution to this problem is to simply iterate through the text and treat every index as a starting location and then check whether the subsequent characters match with the pattern. However, the time complexity of, uh, of this algorithm is O of m times n, where m is the length of the pattern and n is the length of the text. We can improve upon this by uh, employing two other algorithms, which are more sophisticated but pretty easy to implement, known as Rabin Karps and KMP, or Knut Morris Press. String matching in general is also known as a needle in a haystack uh, problem, as it's equivalent, it's similar to finding uh, a needle, uh, a needle which is your pattern inside of a large haystack, which is your text. When trying to imp improve upon the time complexity of the naive uh, algorithm, one idea that comes to mind is to use the hash values of the pattern and the, the sliding window of the text and compare them to each other to see if they match. This is exactly what the rabin karp algorithm does. So when we are, uh, as we slide through the text in, in uh, fragments which are known as sliding, uh, which is known as a sliding window, we compare the hash value of the sliding window to the pattern. However, we also, uh, uh, we also want to make sure that recomputing hash is efficient. One method of hashing, which is uh, efficient when using a sliding window, is called a rolling hash. A rolling hash is essentially a type of hash where uh, as, you, as you move through a text uh, using a sliding window, instead of recomputing the hash for the entire pattern or for the entire sliding window, you simply compute the, the hash of the changed characters and that changes the hash value of the previous sliding window. Uh, rolling hash is extremely efficient and uh, depending on the type of hash function, it can either produce many or few, very few collisions. The rabin karp algorithm depends on very few collisions since when there are collisions, you end up checking when you don't need to check and it becomes closer to the naive algorithm time complexity. Let's take a closer look at some rolling hash methods. Let's consider a, the most simple of all hash methods, simply summing the, uh, the encoding value for each character. Typically, your computer would do this using an ASCII value, but for simplicity, we'll just use the order of the alphabet. In other words, A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and so on. So if you consider your hash function to be the sum of the values of all the characters in the string, then for example, for the first sliding window, A, B, C, D, your value would just be one plus two plus three plus four, which is 10. How, uh, next, when you move the sliding window to B, C, D, E, instead of recomputing everything again, what we can do is we can use the previous sliding window's hash value of 10 and simply adjust it to accommodate for the new character and the character that is lost. So when computing the hash value for B, C, D, and E, 
uh, what we do is we use the value of the previous sliding window and subtract the value for A and add the value for E. So this makes our total a 14, since we subtracted 1 and added 5 to the previous value of 10. Again, repeating this process for C, D, E, F, we see that the hash value we get is uh, the hash value of B, C, D, E, 14, and then you subtract the value for B and add the value for F. And doing this, we get a value of 18, and when we uh, previously, we would have computed our, uh, our hash value for the pattern, and in this case, the pattern also will have a hash value of 18, and since these two hash values coincide, we'll go through, and when we get to this sliding window, we'll check each character to see whether or not they match. Now, this, this hash function is very simplistic, and there are some obvious problems with it. For one, there, there will be a lot of collisions. For example, for ABCD, all permutations of ABCD, including DCBA or any other permutation, uh, will, co will have a hash collision if they appear in the same text. So, um, it, one, one thing we want to reduce is the number of collisions. So in this case, the problem that we have is that order does not matter when computing a hash value since sum is commutative. Let's try to come up with a hash method that, uh, that takes into account the order of the characters. A common, uh, common type of hash to take uh, account for this is the polynomial hash. So the polynomial, uh, the polynomial hash uh, works similarly to the, the simple sum hash, except um, instead of simply adding up the values, we give each one a place value and multiply, uh, multiply it with a constant to an exponential power. So in this case, I've just chosen the simple constant of 10. So the hash value for ABCD would be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, if we perform this computation. And then now, when trying to do the computation for BCDE, again, we don't restart from uh, B, C, D, and E and recompute it that way. Instead, what we do is we use the previous value and simply modify it. So in this case, we subtract it out the first value, multiply it by 10 to shift the place values of every other character, and add the value of the last character, which, give it, which gave us 2, 3, 4, and 5. So this, uh, this method of hashing avoids a lot of the um, collisions that would have occurred by using the sum hashing method. One thing that we have to be careful of, especially when using a uh, polynomial hash, which has uh, numbers to larger and larger exponents depending on the size of your pattern, is integer overflow. One way to take care of this is by taking the entire the hash value modulo some large prime number. You need it to be prime so that uh, you don't get a number that is that doesn't have a GCD of one with the constant, so that you end up getting zero everywhere. And you want uh, you want it to be large, so that you have as few as many numbers as possible, uh, as many hash values as possible, and have as few collisions uh, as there can be. Using a clever method of hashing will allow us to gain uh, to uh, search through the entire string for this pattern in O of m plus n on average and if you, have, uh, if you have a bad hash function, you'll get the same time complexity as a naive uh, algorithm since you'll get collisions at every single, uh, or on many of the sliding window positions. The next algorithm that we'll discuss for string matching is KMP, or Knuth Morse Pratt. So this algorithm is uh, takes advantage of the fact that you don't have to check over every single position every single time. Let's uh, get some intuition for this. Let's take a pattern of ABB, uh, ABBC and let's search through this text. The first character matches, the second character matches, the third character matches, but the fourth character doesn't. Now, intelligently, we know that we don't, inf we in fact don't have to search through the, just the next sliding window because we've already searched through some parts of the, the text, and we know that these two characters are not equal to the first character of A. So we should be able to jump directly over here, instead of just shifting by one. The way that KMP works is by uh, pre-computing a prefix table, and then using that to make shifts that are larger than just one index. Let's take a look at how KMP is able to do this. 
The secret behind KMP success is a prefix length table. What the prefix length, a prefix length table stores is the length of the longest prefix that is equal to the suffix of a certain index. So, for example, for uh, let's go through and fill out the prefix, uh, the prefix length values for every single index. So in this case, uh, by convention, index zero is always given a prefix length of negative one. This is, uh, this is uh, useful for many implementations of KMP. Now let's fill in the rest of the values of the table. So the prefix length of A will be zero because uh, A does not have any uh, suffix. Now let's look at the next uh, character, B. This again is zero. C, the, uh, the suffix of C does not match any of the prefix, uh, the prefix letters. So again, this is zero. All the, uh, all the indices will receive a value of zero up till this A. Now this A has a suffix of A and it also matches the prefix of A. So it has a length one prefix. The letter, uh, the uh, index A, B has a suffix A, B, and it also has a prefix of A, B, so length two. And C has a length three suffix equal to a length three prefix. A, B, C is equal, equivalent to A, B, C. So we give it a value of three. Again, Y does not have a, a prefix equal to its suffix, so we give it a value of zero. This is a setup of the prefix table, which is used uh, during the KMP algorithm. Now let's take a look at how the KMP search algorithm works. So using the pattern that we made the prefix on the table for, let's run through uh, the algorithm on this text. So in the first, uh, first three sliding window positions, we see that the first character itself does not match. The dash does not, uh, is not the same thing as an A, so we keep shifting our sliding window. However, when we get to our fourth sliding window position, we see that all the characters up till the uh, second C match up. Now, the special thing about KMP is that instead of shifting again by just one character, we can use this information we've learned. So we know that the, the location of the first mismatch is at C. So now we can calculate how much we can shift. So uh, the index of the first mismatch was, C, uh, was nine. So uh, the amount we can shift by is nine minus the value present in the table for nine. So in this case, three. So we can shift by nine minus three, six. We can, uh, we can shift the entire window by six instead of just one. So now uh, A goes from the previous value of index one all the way up to index seven uh, relative, uh, in the, uh, relative to the sliding window. And one thing that we've noticed, which is pretty interesting, is that A and B coincide with the a, uh, new location of A and B. And this is actually no co uh, coincidence. In fact, it's what allows KMP to work. We ca uh, the values stored in the prefix of table are essentially telling us how much we can move the sliding window so that the, the location where we are in the text matches up with what we have in the prefix of the pattern. Now, KMP has an overall time complexity of O of M plus N for both uh, average and worst case. We take up O of M in the pre-processing uh, for the prefix length table, and we take O of N for the search process itself. Next, we'll look at string data structures. We're gonna cover three different uh, string data structures, tries, suffix arrays, and suffix trees. Let's start off with tries. A try is a tree-based data structure that supports linear time lookup and insertion. Each edge is labeled with a character as shown uh, on the board. Uh, every path represents a prefix. So for example, a path from, uh, every path from the root to a certain vertex represents a prefix. So for example, from, this, uh, from the root to, uh, to this uh, node at depth level two, we have the prefix CO, which is the prefix of the string cow. Uh, another example is, uh, is the path from the root to the, this uh, depth level two vertex, which is a prefix, which is the prefix MO. 
M-O is the prefix for mo, mom, mu, and mop in this example. So every string is represented by uh, is also represented by a path from uh, the root node to one of the leaves. So for example, cow is an entire string and it's represented by a path from the root to a leaf. Uh, the advantage of string, uh, the advantage of tries is that it combines pre, uh, it combines common prefixes and allows us to perform computations on prefixes very efficiently. Also note that we append a dollar sign at the end of every string to make it easier to identify when a string ends. This helps when implementing tries. The next data structure that we will consider is a suffix array. Suffix arrays are one of the simplest uh, data structures that are used for strings. So the first step to, in creating a suffix array is to first create a list of all the suffixes. Uh, we index the suffixes by, the, by their length. So the original string has, uh, is first, then comes the, uh, the next suffix, uh, the next longest suffix, then the suffix after that, all the way up to the empty string. So then to create the suffix array, what we do is we sort the suffixes in lexicographic order. And the suffix array itself does not consist of the suffixes, but instead their indices. So in this case, uh, after we sort it, we see that uh, our suffix our suffix array is five zero four three two one rather than the uh, the right side of the uh, of the column chart. So suffix arrays are useful because uh, because of a, a crucial observation. The observation is that every substring is a prefix of a suffix. So um, what this means is that we can use the information contained in, contained in the suffix array and along with a data structure that does well with prefixes such as either uh, ha uh, either tries or even um, an algorithm such as hashing, we can, uh, we can efficiently make use of the suffixes of a string and get information about substrings. In fact, a try built from suffixes is known as a suffix tree and we'll co cover that uh, next. The last data structure that we will study is a suffix tree. Before we look at suffix trees, however, let's first look at a suffix try. A suffix try is essentially a try of all the suffixes in, of a string. So if our string is ACACAG, and these are the list, uh, this is a list of all the suffixes of a string, then this would be the suffix try of that string. Given that this is a suffix try, this is the suffix tree that is derived from it. The modification that we make from going from a suffix try to a suffix tree is to combine all the nodes that contain uh, that contain only uh, one child. So, for example, this entire branch C A G and dollar sign the edges uh, those with those being the labels of the edges we combine all of those into simply one edge. And so this makes the suffix tree more compact and therefore uh, it makes computations on suffix tri trees much more efficient than on a suffix try. Suffix trees are useful in a variety of um, optimization uh, algorithms for st uh, common string problems. Um, the, the drawback to using suffix trees is that they're, uh, they're tricky to implement in a contest setting. It, might, it may not be a good idea to take the risk of, constructing, of, of implementing a suffix tree efficiently. However, given that uh, if you're given a suffix tree uh, built and ready to use, it, uh, it can be used for um, it can be very useful to increase the efficiency of algorithms. Next, we'll look at uh, an algorithm. Or next, we'll look at one of the DP problems that we uh, that we started looking at in the beginning of the lecture, the longest common substring problem, and we'll solve it using the suffix tree. We'll finish off the lecture by talking about uh, one of the problems that we looked at in the beginning of the lecture, uh, the longest common substring problem. In the beginning, we solved this problem using dynamic programming, and our solution was O of m times n. However, using a suffix tree, we can in fact find the longest common substring in O of, in o of m plus n. So let the two strings be s1 and s2. To differentiate between the two strings and the suffix tree, we'll let the ending character of s1 be a hashtag as opposed to a dollar sign. When constructing the, uh, the, when constructing the suffix tree, um, We'll, uh, we'll put both strings in the same suffix tree. Uh, other than this modification, there is no difference between this generalized suffix tree and our regular suffix tree for a single string. 
So after completing this construction in O of M plus N, now we have to use a DFS to identify which nodes contain suffixes for both uh, string one and string two. In this case, all the, uh, all the nodes which satisfy this property are marked in black. So uh, after identifying uh, which nodes uh, contain suffixes for both strings, all we have to do is identify the deepest node. So in this case, that's, uh, that's this node since uh, it contains two characters on its edge. So therefore, the longest common substring between these two strings is CG. Our overall time complexity is also O of M plus N since our construction was O of M plus N and our DFS was also, uh, had also had a time complexity of O of M plus N. I've included uh, implementations in both Java and C++ in my lecture packet, so make sure you look at those lecture notes to get uh, an even more in-depth uh, coverage of uh, advanced string algorithms. Thank you for listening to my lecture, and I hope you learned a lot about techniques and algorithms that can help you increase the efficiency of your string programs.